What does the Bible say about women? Does it really put women under subjection and consider them to be inferior creatures, as some people claim? You'll hear the answer today, so please stay with us. We welcome you again to another session of Questions and Answers. The questions were answered by Dr. J. Vernon McGee over the course of more than 30 years as he taught through the Bible on radio. And this program is brought to you by the Through the Bible Radio Network. Now here's our first question for today. It comes from Visalia, California. And this listener is puzzled about Dr. McGee's comment on Israel made during his study in the book of Zechariah. In the 12th chapter, verse 3, Zechariah says, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. From his edited messages, here are Dr. McGee's comments. Even today, that city has become a burdensome stone. It almost broke up the common market and wrecked NATO, and those nations, including England, which have tried to rule it, have suffered because of it. And he added, frankly, I hope that the United States doesn't get too involved. So the listener says, The scripture tells us that the Lord will bless those who are friendly to Israel and curse its enemies. That doesn't seem to agree with your statement. Please elaborate on this. Well, I'll be very happy to tell you what we mean by not getting involved. It's true that every president since World War II has made it very clear in his running for office, and especially those that were elected, that they would continue the same relationship with Israel that we had at the beginning, and that is to defend their right to exist as a nation. And I candidly think that was a good thing to do. But I do believe that there's some very interesting things that should be noted. And the passage that you give is Zechariah 12, verse 2, and I should read verse 2 and 3. It says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, let me say just a word relative to this. Here is a scripture where God says that Jerusalem will become a burdensome stone, an offense. And those that get involved with it, in that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. And that's in that day he'll do that. But it's very interesting, the scriptures that you give me. God said concerning the people, the individual people, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. Because you see, they went for 2,500 years without being a national entity at all. And it was in that period also that God is not talking about a nation, but a people. But he's talking about a nation here in Zechariah. Jerusalem is the capital, and he speaks of Judah. So that we're talking here about a nation. In the other passage, we're talking about the people that constitute the nation, of course. And actually, at every return that Israel's made back to the land, it's been only a very small minority that returned, just a remnant. God says he's always left himself a remnant. It's always been just a remnant that obeyed him. When they were in Babylonian captivity, around 60,000 people came out in it. Uh, Several million people remained. They did not attempt to return back to the land. And certainly today, you're aware of the fact that very few of the nation Israel have returned. Well, there are more in New York City. And Los Angeles does pretty well, by the way. I think we could equal Jerusalem as it is today, or the whole land of Israel. So we are actually talking about a national entity that constitutes only a minority of the people. 
Now, God says he'll bless the people, uh, bless them that bless you. And I think that one of the reasons that for so long, England was blessed of God, and then the United States, because they did find freedom in this land, although there were restrictions at one time put up, and I guess maybe in some places they still exist. But at least we have taken a different attitude toward them. And as a result, we've had an attitude toward this small nation, small group that have returned back to the land. Now, the question arises, what about our engagement with them? I think that we ought to protect them, but I think we ought to weigh the cost that it will cost us and has cost us, by the way. Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to the time of Egypt. Egypt concerned themselves with these people, took them into captivity. Egypt was one of the first great world powers. Egypt isn't that today. And then as you move on down, Babylon took them into captivity. And you notice what happened to Babylon? The Roman Empire took them into captivity. And notice what happened to the Roman Empire. And Great Britain, for a while, you will recall, they exercised an authority over that land after World War I. And they gave up that authority at World War II, and they were made a member of the United Nations. And Great Britain and the United States are two nations that still pledge their defense. But isn't it interesting that England has gone down? And I personally think we are going down as a nation today. I don't think that we can exist as a nation that claims to be Christian and has gone into gross immorality today and I think practically have rejected the Judaic Israel moral standard. And therefore, I believe today that we have seen that it's going to cost something to defend these people. And the question arises, should we support them as a nation? Well, I think that from the political side, we're bound to, because the minute that we would relax, communist Russia would move in and take over. And I'm not sure, but what, according to the Word of God, they're going to do that in the last days. And it's things like these that are happening today that make me believe that we are definitely in the last days. Well, you may want to consider the significant events concerning Israel since Dr. McGee made that analysis of the situation. And although many things have changed, what the Bible says about Israel continues to be true, and eventually all the prophecies will be fulfilled as God has said. Now let's come to a question from Columbus, Ohio. This person asks, please tell us what the Scripture says about repentance. I'm very happy to do that. I believe that repentance is one of the great theological doctrines. I think that today it's been put in the wrong place. I think it has a place today, but there are those, and especially the evangelists, that are constantly saying that you're to repent and believe. Well, if you ask me, that's the wrong order. It ought to be believe and repent. Now, if you will notice through Scripture that it's quite interesting that it's God's people that are always called to repentance. The unsaved are called upon to believe, but the Christians today are called upon to repent. There are seven messages to seven churches, and these messages came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to all these churches, repent. Repent is the business of those that claim to be Christian. And believe me, at this present moment, there should be some repentance in our churches. I do not know about you, but this psychological preaching today that tells us that we should have self-esteem, and believe me, you don't have to tell some of the saints and some of the preachers that they need self-esteem. They've got it. They have a super supply of this matter of self-esteem. Well, that's, you see, not really the way God has given it to us. 
Isaiah, when he got in the presence of God, he says, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I feel like saying, where's your self-esteem, Isaiah? Well, when he got in God's presence, he lost it. Because God's people, if today we could get in God's presence, we'd lose self-esteem and we'd be down on our faces repenting. And that is what we're told. Paul says very frankly to the Philippians, a group that he loved, he says, let each esteem another better than themselves. And today that we are to take the place that we are lost sinners. And if there's one thing needed by the church today, it's some good old-fashioned repentance. And that is the thing you're not hearing today at all. And my friend, if we had repentance, we'd solve some of these problems that's in the home today. We'd have better husbands and fathers and better wives and mothers than we have. Repentance is for the believer. Now, does it figure in when an unsaved person comes to Christ? And yes, it does. It certainly figures in there. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Repentance means change of mind, our change of the heart. Be going one way and turn and go the other. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said to them, says, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. You've got all of the theology you need in that statement right there. You turn to God. How did they turn to God? Paul went to Thessalonica and preached Christ to them, the gospel, and they trusted the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And now he said, you have turned to God from idols. Well, they were gross idolaters in Athens. The Athenians worshipped everything that moved and a lot of things that didn't move. They worshipped. They worshipped the sun, moon, and stars, and they had enough gods on top of Mount Olympus to fill any stadium in this country today. Believe me, they were not in short supply on gods that they worshipped, and they were given over to idolatry, and Paul accused them of that. And they put an idol to an unknown God just in case they happened to miss one. And Paul preached to them, and he told about the living God. Now, what was it then that the Thessalonians did? They turned to God from idols. That was their repentance. You see, faith comes before repentance. May I say to you, it's nice to go to the Lord personally and tell him how you failed him. And I find that I have to go there too frequently and tell him how I failed him and repent. May I say to you, repentance is the best cleansing that you can have in this day in which we live. It's better than any of these massages that they're talking about today or any ointment that you can put on. Just a good old-fashioned dose of repentance is what we need today. Now here's another question. Genesis 8.21, we read that God promised not to destroy every living thing again as he did in the flood. So the question is, since God promised never to kill every living creature again, what about all the creatures who will be destroyed when the earth burns? And she adds, I hope that I don't sound stupid. No, I think you have a very good question there, by the way. But there's something that I'd like for you to note. And you will remember that when God made a covenant with Noah, that was at the end of the flood. And that covenant is a covenant, I think, frankly, that you and I ought to look at for just a few minutes. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, and you'll find it there. Now, you didn't read quite enough scripture. You gave me Genesis 8, 21, and let me read it. The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now, if you just read that, 
you might come to the conclusion then that God has gone back on his word when he says that this earth is to be destroyed with fire the next time. But you ought to read all that covenant that God made with Noah. And I want to just go down in chapter 9 in this covenant God made with Noah and lift out this one verse that I think is very important. He says here in verse 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. And at the hand of man, as at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. In other words, he puts in here this matter of capital punishment, and a man is to surrender his life when he destroys life. So here is the thing that's important. He says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And then God went on to say here in this same passage of Scripture, he says, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Now, may I say to you, he says, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and that never again will he destroy the earth with a flood. Verse 11, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. But he didn't say that it wouldn't be done by fire the next time, you see. So you have not found a contradiction, by the way, in the Word of God. The first judgment, the judgment of the earth and Noah's day was a water judgment. The judgment that's coming in the future is a fire judgment when this earth is to be purified by fire. A lady who works in a nursing home wrote to Dr. McGee from Lakeland, Georgia, with a plea for consideration of women and their place in the church. She feels that preachers, including Dr. McGee, often put down women, almost to the extent of indicating that they are unworthy of heaven. Well, may I say to you, if I've said anything that has given you the impression that I don't think there's any hope for women, well, I've certainly given a wrong impression because that's not true of Scripture at all. There are several things maybe I should mention now in connection with this. Did you know that the hope of the world was one time in the hands of a woman? In fact, if you're going to have any offspring, that's all in the hands of the woman. It was Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's true that she was first in the offense. The Scripture takes note of that. She was first in the offense, but Adam also was around and He was guilty also, and they both then were sinners. But did you know that the only way God had of bringing the Savior into the world was through a woman and without the help of any man? If you want to say that woman brought sin into the world, then be sure and say that she brought the Savior into the world. Now, we criticize the Roman Catholic Church for what we believe that they do in exalting Mary as the mother of God, but we need to recognize that she's mother of the human side of the Lord Jesus. She's the mother of Jesus, and the angel was very careful to say, you're going to call his name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins, and he's Jesus because the angel said it's Emmanuel, God with us. He was God manifested in the flesh. And so she brought Jesus into the world. But in her magnificence, she makes it clear that she calls him her Savior. And she needed a Savior just like any other person needs a Savior. Now, women have occupied a high position in Scripture. And it's true there have been several bad ones on the pages of Scripture. But there have been a great many more good ones. Take the mother of Samuel, for instance, a real godly woman. And I believe that the mother actually of Solomon was a godly woman. It was David's sin. You noticed in the genealogy in Matthew, Bathsheba's name is not even mentioned. It says of her 
that had been the wife of Urias. God protected her because it was not her sin. And then if you notice the list of the kings of Israel and Judah, and in the kings of Israel, there's not a good one. But if you go through the ones of Judah, there are several of them that are good kings. And every one of them that's a good king, his mother's name is mentioned. The mother was responsible, not the father. I believe and agree with you that there ought to be today rethinking of the place of women in the church because we've come up now with so many viewpoints and some of them very unscriptural indeed. I do not believe that a woman should be a preacher because I think she's got a better job than any preacher's ever had. The ones that have been great men have had great mothers. And so the Scripture doesn't give any idea at all that any woman is lost because she's a woman. That's not true at all. And the many godly ones. You remember that Paul talks about the godly mother that Timothy had. And he had a godly grandmother. And he mentions those things. Paul said in one place, he said, help those women that labored with me in the gospel. And that is quite interesting also because they had a place in the early church and they served God. So I'll be frank with you. I don't think I could say any more, or at least I can't say any more on this question and answer program. As Dr. McGee goes through the Bible in five years, he covers every book and chapter, but not always every verse. And sometimes he'll say just a few words about some verses. Unfortunately, that's what he had to do in order to get through all 66 books in about 260 weeks. So a listener in Fresno, California, wondered whether he had covered John 21, verses 18 and 19. She says, I don't understand these verses. If you explained them before, I must have missed it. And I can assure you that we did deal with those two verses that you refer to. But I'll turn to them. It's John now 21, the Gospel of John, verses 18 and 19. And they read as follows. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Thus spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now he's talking to and about Simon Peter. And what he's saying simply is this. When you were a young man, a young fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, well, the Sea of Galilee was yours and all the surrounding countryside. And as a young man, you could roam here and there. You could fish where you wanted to, and you gird your own loins. And that is an expression that was used then because they wore a garment that was like a dress And in girding their loins, they would pull it up around their hind quarters and tie it. And they would gird themselves, gird themselves to work or gird themselves to go where they wanted to. Now he says, Simon Peter, you're going to get old and somebody else is going to gird you. But this time they're going to take you to a place that you didn't want to go to. And that is the place where where he died. Simon Peter was crucified as the Lord was crucified. And tradition says he asked to be crucified upside down. I personally don't see the meaning in that, but nevertheless, that is the tradition that has been given. But he's telling him now that he is to be crucified. And that, of course, he'll be taken where he doesn't want to go, because although he said to the Lord Jesus, He says, I'll lay down my life for thy sake. When the day came and the heroics are over, Simon Peter was there ready to die, but it wasn't something that he relished. It wasn't something that he looked forward to by any means. But he's telling him that he's to die that kind of a death. In other words, when he was young, he could go where he wanted to, but now 
in death, somebody else will take care of that for you. And you'll not have even that freedom at all that even comes in death. With that, we must conclude another question and answer program. If you'd like more information on many of these issues and more, then call us right now and leave a message requesting our resource catalog. And when you call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Today's broadcast is available for purchase on a single CD, which is a really convenient way to pass on Dr. McGee's teaching to others who you think might be interested in learning what the Bible has to say about their questions and problems. And by the way, are you listening to the Through the Bible radio program? You know, it's Dr. McGee's five-year study that goes through the whole Word of God, and it can be heard on this station every Monday through Friday. Notes and outlines are available to follow along with these studies when you ask for them. If you'd like to contact our offices for the catalog, ask for the notes, or request to be on the mailing list, call 1-800-65-BIBLE Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time, or write to Questions and Answers in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. For those in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or visit us online at www.ttb.org. Now until this same time next week, we pray that our God will answer all your questions and solve all your problems. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.